Uh, Professor Orian Sovol is Professor of International Business at the Stockholm School of Economics, one of Europe's leading business schools, which draws upon a unique business community network and private funding to limit its reliance on government support. He's director of the school's Centre for Strategy and Competitiveness, which focuses on researching strategy, funnily enough, international business, knowledge in networks, clusters and competitiveness, and policy more generally. He's also director of the European Cluster Observatory, an EU website that informs policymakers, cluster practitioners, and researchers throughout the world about European clusters and cluster policies. So please make Professor Solvell welcome. Um, so maybe this might be a bit technical for you. First of all, if you haven't been to the other sessions, uh, what are clusters all about? It's about, uh, we are interested in innovation, we are interested in creating new knowledge, new ideas, but not just creating new ideas, uh, <clears throat> but also turning those ideas into products and services, i.e. what we call innovations that create value and uh, that are used by many, many people. So there are many ideas out there in the world, um, and, uh, but very few of them actually make it to become the Facebooks or the Twitters, whatever, of the world. And one of the things is that, uh, that makes these ideas actually turn into real innovations has to do with the environment within which these ideas are sort of are planted. It needs to be, these seeds need to be planted in some sort of soil and climate. And uh, we try to measure that. What is the soil and climate of different parts of Europe when it comes to different types of industries uh, for innovations? So what we do technically is that we, we look at sectors or industries, and uh, in this case, uh, more than 600 industries to look across the whole range. And then we <coughs> divide it up by regions. Uh, and I actually asked someone yesterday uh, at a dinner, uh, what about Australia? Do you know where you have your clusters, the strong areas and the weak areas in terms of having agglomerations of firms and research, etc., in particular areas? And as I understand, there is no such observatory for, for Australia uh, as of yet. So I hope we can help to, to build something of the same sort as we have in Europe. Today. In this sense, we, we take lots of raw data on employment and uh, uh, human capital, all kinds of things uh, around uh, that are important to measure clusters here. And we perceive that so people can do uh, maps and tables. And in the beginning, we sort of decided what, what they were supposed to read. And after a few years, we realized that's not the way that people want it. They want to make their own maps. They want to make their own tables. They want to make their own regions, even. Uh, they say, we're not interested in uh, a particular region in Sweden. I'm interested in the Baltic Sea region, or I'm interested in the Danube region. There are many kinds of regions. So we allowed for the tool for people to decide on the sectors and to decide on the, on the regional scale as well. And then you make that into uh, graphs and tables and what I call uh, bubble charts, where you can see how this changes over time. We also put up a library uh, and other sort of services on this observatory where people can download uh, reports around these things of innovation and clusters. Uh, and we did another tool called organization mapping. So uh, science parks, incubators, all kinds of organizations that are very, very important to make these clusters sort of dynamic and, and tick, sort of Silicon Valley <laughs> style. So, um, and you can see that this is used all over the world, uh, of course, mostly in Europe, but also by other, others, uh, in terms of downloading maps and tables uh, and books and reports here. Uh, here's an example by the economists that were writing a story about the German economy, and they talked about the, uh, the different clusters that, uh, that are the leading clusters of Germany, and they actually picked the data from, from the European Cluster Observatory here in this, in this article. It's used by practitioners. It is used by cluster organizations that uh, work in this field, uh, by researchers. Uh, I see some witnesses here how they like the data. It's free of charge. Of course, I like that. Um, and it's used to inspire policy debate. So far in Europe, there have been a number of reports from uh, the European Commission talking about the future of, uh, of uh, European industry, uh, future of innovation and technology, where they use this kind of data uh, in various ways. I'll skip this one. 
And now we're trying to build this up. So we talk to uh, organizations in Latin America. We have our friends in the United States. Uh, so if you go to what we now created called the Global Cluster Observatory, you can click on various parts of the world. And as you see, uh, there is a missing dot uh, on Australia there. So hopefully after this visit, I've only been here two days in Adelaide, uh, we make sure that there is a dot uh, now also for, for Australia in the future. So we can also measure, because there's always a lot of you know, ideas of, uh, you know, we have a strong cluster, we have, you know, we have this and that, but it's really good to have some data, and as researchers, we like, uh, like hard facts and data uh, to show where are the strong and weak points, and with that data, you can start to build, to build the clusters also here in, in Australia. Thank you. Whizzing through, thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Weiner. Um, Catherine's Editor-in-Chief of The Guardian Australia and Deputy Editor of The Guardian Worldwide. She joined The Guardian in 1997 and has worked as a writer, editor of Weekend magazine, features editor and Saturday editor. I'm particularly interested that she's also a board member of London's Royal Court Theatre and is co-editor with Alan Rickman of the award-winning play My Name is Rachel Corrie. And uh, Kath, uh, Catherine uh, tweets at, at <laughs> Kath Viner. Um, so please, welcome Catherine. Thank you. I've, I've actually prepared to talk about um, journalism, but I'll be happy to talk about theatre as well later if, if people are interested. So, um, yes. Um, Guardian Australia launched at the end of May. I hope you've all had a look at it. Um, and it's been um, sort of really successful. We're really delighted. But I think one of the things I'd like to talk about is how, um, you know, because we're digital only in Australia, we're only a website, whereas in the UK um, there's a newspaper as well as a website. Um, the sort of liberation of that and how digital journalism um, is changing, well, it's changing all of our lives, of course, in every single respect, um, but I've, I can talk particularly about how it's changing journalism um, in all ways, um, in, a, in ways that are un unleashing a really sort of innovative creativity if, if we want it to. Um, so I thought I'd look at the why, what, when, where, how, because it's changing all of those. Um, it's changing the why the least, I think, um, People want journalism, just as, and they need journalism just as much as they always did. Um, the purpose of journalism, my favourite definition of the purpose of it, is Lord Northcliffe, who said, um, uh, journalism or news is something that someone, somewhere, doesn't want printed. <laughs> so there's always a need for that, and I would argue there's more of a need than ever, that people, because there's so much information, we can get all sorts of wrong information everywhere all the time. So you could argue that the why is the same as it's always been, but it's stronger. And everything else is completely different. So, so if we start with the, um, we'll start with the what. So things happen, they've always happened. There's an idea, there's always been ideas. In the print era, what you'd, you'd start with an event and you'd say, right, we can do a 450 word article, a 650 word article, 850, 1200, or a really massive one for the magazine. That was it. Different format, you know, you could do different lengths, you could do different types of thing, it could be an interview, it could be a backgrounder, but really it's all writing to different lengths. Now, if something happens, we can say, shall we do one of these articles? Or shall we do a video? Shall we do some quick audio? Shall we do um, a list of tweets? Shall we just um, do um, um, a call out to our readers for what they've found? Should we ask our readers for pictures or should we send out a photographer? Um, should we just do something for mobile? Um, should we turn it into a visualization? Is this just a data story? Is it interactive that we should build over many weeks? There is, it's like there's suddenly a plethora of possibilities when there used to be just do an article. Um, and so it's suddenly become this incredibly creative world in a way that it wasn't before, if, if we want to embrace that. Um, the how is also very different and in really positive ways, I think. So there's different ways you can get stories now. It, it used to be um, you just had to send reporters out to go and get them. Now stories come to you um, if you're open to them. So um, there's a great example of this. Um, there was a, a man called Ian Tomlinson who died during the G20 protests in London um, five years ago, I think. Uh, 
I can't remember the date exactly. Um, he had collapsed and died at this protest just while he was walking through it. Um, and it smelt kind of strange. It seemed unusual that he should collapse and die in the middle of a protest that so we, we decided to look into it a bit further. And we asked, we put out on Twitter, Facebook, and with our readers on the site, saying, did you see this man collapse and die? Did you see it happen? And we had quite a few readers contacting us. And one of the readers who contacted us was uh, a reader in New York. And he had been, he was an investment fund manager who had been in London on business. And he'd seen there was these protests, and so he'd nipped out of his meetings with his incredibly expensive smartphone, um, incredibly expensive because, you know, he's an investment fund manager, and he had filmed some of these protests. He'd seen our call out, and he'd looked through his, the, the stuff he'd filmed, and he saw a very clear image of Ian Tomlinson being shoved over by a police officer. This was obviously a huge um, story, um, and the, um, the Metropolitan Police have just um, done a compensation claim with Ian Tomlinson's family, and the policeman has been struck off. Um, they, they're the sort of stories we could never have got before because the hedge fund manager wouldn't have had a very expensive phone in his pocket. Um, he wouldn't have read The Guardian in New York. He wouldn't have known that this man had died because he wouldn't have heard about it through The Guardian. And he wouldn't have known that we were looking for witnesses to it because he wouldn't have seen the call out on The Guardian. Um, there's, there's loads of examples I can give you about that. Another one is during the um, English riots. Um, I think it was a big story here as well that sort of a few summers ago, um, the cities were just aflame. And um, we sent our, um, there were so many myths going around on social media. There were some absolutely hilarious ones that somehow, because it was such a mad sort of 72 hours, people believed them. So one of the stories that went around that was that um, the zoo in the middle of Regent's Park. Um, rioters had burnt down the gates and tigers were running around London. <laughs> and another one was that um, people had broken into McDonald's and were cooking their own food in the <laughs> kitchens. Because that's what we'd all do, isn't it, if we got the chance. Um, um, so all these myths were flying around. but. Um, you, you know, only, you've only got a limited number of reporters, and there were riots all over London and then subsequently all around the country. So what we did, we, we had one of, our, uh, set one of our reporters to begin with and then several. We sent them around the country um, our read, by our readers. So one of our readers would say, a building's on fire on the corner of this street and this street in Tottenham. And so then we would say, can anyone else confirm it? And if enough people confirmed it, then we'd send the reporter there. And then the reporter would say, am I in the right place? I'm in Tottenham. Is anything else happening nearby? And built up the, absolutely the richest portrait of those riots through using, our, you know, our readers helping us, really. It was, that, that wasn't a Guardian report as much as a, a Guardian collaboration with the, our readers. Um, so, um, again, I could give lots of examples of this, but it, I think the how is almost, almost the most exciting change, um, the, the innovation. Um, the where is also a big change. Um, when we started, The Guardian started in 1821, it sold 1,000 copies in the Greater Manchester area. Um, and now, um, two-thirds of The Guardian's readership is outside of Britain. Um, we've got 40 million readers, the third biggest English language newspaper website in the world, um, and most of that is outside of Britain. So um, now the where is all up for grabs. Anyone can have an international readership because the World Wide Web is worldwide. Um, and then just finally is the who. Um, it used to be just journalists who were able, who'd got a job at a national or, or local newspaper that were allowed to call themselves journalists. There were, there's this great phrase, there used to be uh, a few writers and many readers. And now it's hard to tell the difference. So the, the who has got much bigger. Basically, anyone who reports anything, sees anything and, and reports it fairly, is a journalist or is at least committing an act of journalism. During the um, Arab uprisings, we, and particularly in Egypt, um, if you remember, it was a great a time of much excitement and optimism. And um, 
we, through, through again, through being open, through asking for lots of different, um, so, uh, including publishing, we published some reports in Arabic as well as English, we tried to get some Egyptian writers to write for us because, you know, there's a traditional way to write about the world and that's to have foreign policy experts who always tend to be a particular type of, you know, older white man. Um, and we thought we want to know what Egyptians on the street think, not just the foreign policy experts. And in the end, we got, I think it was 28 Egyptian writers to write about what was happening in Egypt. Um, most of them in English, but some we did um, bilingually. And um, I just think, again, you know, that, that how much a richer coverage of an event was that than we've been able to do previously. Um, so I think if, if what we're talking about is interdisciplinarity, then I think suddenly journalism is about spreading in all, all sorts of areas. I mean, talking about art and science, I've got a great example of, um, you remember when the um, Gulf oil spill happened and there was the video of the oil sort of gushing out of the earth and it was very disturbing and no one knew how to stop it. And as I recall, BP, who owned the um, prospect, they put out their own call like, oh, how do we stop it? Anyone know? So the Guardian did one, and um, it was just a Google Doc, <laughs> you know, open Google, Google Doc that we put up, and we said, how should it be stopped? And, you know, a few people in the office were joking, saying, oh, you'll have some idiot saying, put a tennis ball in it or whatever. But actually, we got, you know, marine engineers and pipework experts and um, a whole array of specialists in amazing different areas coming in and putting their suggestions of how it could be stopped. And so we took the best ones and we subjected them to scrutiny and tried to work out the best ideas. Again, a kind of, what an interesting collaboration between journalists and experts. It used to be you just have a journalist sort of posing as the expert or representing the experts, but now we can kind of host all of them and be part of all of them, really. Anyway, okay, talk about more, but here we go. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's really hard to imagine Rupert being as open to that kind of collaborative <laughs> input. As, uh, well, he isn't. <laughs> Um, okay, our final speaker today is Professor Tim Sendon. Um, Tim's a graduate of the ANU, the Australian National University. He completed his BSc Honours in Physical Chemistry in 1989 and sub subsequently a PhD in Atomic Force Microscopy in 1993. He's held positions in Paris, Strasbourg and in Sydney before returning to the Department of Applied Mathematics in Canberra in 1997. Now head of department, Tim is in the process of establishing a national centre for quantitative 3D analysis called CT Lab that will provide access to advanced 3D scanning and printing facilities as well as the software tools needed to analyse 3D data. And I think um, I'm correct that this is actually a partnership between the department and other areas within the university, which is um, a, a very interesting. Thank you, Vicky. Um, Great, thanks. So the, uh, I, I'm really struck by your, your comments, actually, because I think when I was trying to put this together, like a typical scientist, I tried to pull apart the group and why we've become so multidisciplinary. And it's, it's quite a, a nice process of in, introspection, I think. It, it's an introspective thing to do, and it's, it's great to see the elements of what makes a, a multidisciplinary department. Um, it depends on the discipline, and, and I think some of the print media organisations around the world haven't actually been prepared for it and prepared for embracing the new technology, and, and they've been well and truly left behind. So the Guardian stands out in that respect. Um, and it'd be very interesting to delve into the, the psychology, the sociology of the workplace, why it was so well prepared to take on these new challenges. So it's that sort of story I wanted to lead in with this, because as announced, as announced in the, um, the program, somehow there's this science-art connection in our department, and it's not the way I'd start the story, because preparing a group of academics to accept an artist is is a challenge in its own right. So I went back to, uh, well, but a good challenge, actually, as you'll see, I hope. So the, um, the founder, Barry Ninham, uh, always said, basically, if you get the, um, the basics right, the rest will follow. And he said that from a scientific perspective. And he had an opportunity as a very young professor um, to put together a group of uh, scientists and mathematicians into a department he named the Department of Applied Mathematics. Now, it's a complete misnomer. 
that there's, um, of the, about the 60 people in the department, only about five or six are true mathematicians, or have ever been for that matter. But what he wanted to do was set up a, an interface between disciplines. And he deci decided that if he'd set up a department of a chemical physics or surface science or something with a discrete name, then we'd be locked in. We'd have this conceptual lock to what we do for the rest of the eternity. So he thought applied maths was the most neutral term. Um, so that's, that's the origin. But he put together a, a number of people who meet through scientific uh, disciplines, and, and that's fine for the first 30 or so years of the department where we're you know, grossly, maybe, excessively publicly funded to do blue sky, self-motivated research. But as you all know, there's, there's only a limited stomach the public have for blue sky uh, undirected research, and there's some accountability these days. Uh, in fact, there always has been. It's just it was largely ignored by scientists, I suspect, to some extent. So we had uh, an opportunity, really, to build a lot of different science. I'm not going to really talk about the science, but we built instruments, and that's an example of a new 3D X-ray microscope we've designed, and then a whole lot of other bits and pieces of scientists, science, which have been motivated by the deep mathematics of uh, structure and function in, in nature. Um, building mathematical tools. We looked at, um, in that case, you can see the cross-section of a, uh, an ant's brain. You can see the, uh, the mushroom bodies actually uh, dictate how that ant learns. It's a jack jumper and network analysis, uh, topological analysis, all these things we could talk in detail, but I didn't really want to talk about the science, more of uh, the sociology and the motivations of the group. Basically, you had a collection of people that would work on any topic between biology, physics and chemistry, and they built a number of tools. Now, let's put that all into one group, okay? We we'll just call it the group, and you've got a couple of things that um, allow them to collaborate, right? So you've got the expertise, that's one thing. But then you've got the instruments, the experimental expertise uh, embodied in a, a physical instrument, and then software tools which include algorithms and maths and so on. What you see revolving there is the first mention I'll make of art and science. <laughs> it's not, it is real data, but it's not an actual skull. It's a um, 3D, colour 3D printout. And what you saw revolving there was um, a 3D scan from our system. Um, so could you just pass around to the next person? Just, could, you could just pass it on. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thank you. So what you see is... Um, a skull, it's immediate, immediately recognisable, but what we're seeing in terms of coloration aren't shadows and mineralizations and all those things you might see in a normal skull. It's a colour map of how thick, how dense the bone is in that particular region. So it's like a, a geographical map, but where we're colouring it with density, bone density. So it's immediately a different way of seeing 3D data. And what you're seeing there is a 3D printout of that data. So it's a good example of where once you've built these tools and expertise, you can leap out of this box. So we generally sit inside this framework we call an academically free framework. And this is a non-commercial, uh, all fields, no holds barred sort of free space to think. And we got some money for that and that's good, but you know, it's, it's only so much. And one of the challenges we had in going from what the department was originally defined to do into something um, which allowed us to get external funding, shall I say, was to breed this ability, this uh, openness, this acceptance to talk to other people, other lang uh, develop other languages for industry. One of the tools that came out of our original research was a way of looking at things in 3D. And what you see here is a um, one millimetre cubed piece of sandstone. Um, and what you see shortly is it showing a computer simulation of fluid flowing through those pore spaces. So they're very tiny pore spaces. They're pores about the size of a human hair or so. This is an experiment you cannot do for real, but in a computer, in a supercomputer, you can. And it gives us insights into how oil can be efficiently removed from rocks, how groundwater contamination um, spreads, and all sorts of lovely things like that. But it came from a fun fundamental piece of work. Well, the, the area of industry that, of course, would benefit most greatly from that area, of course, is the oil industry. And so we developed a relationship with companies in an open industry consortium where we basically were working in a non-commercial way and publishing all our results, keeping all the IP, I might say. And then we, we basically built that opportunity to have a language, a dialogue with industry. And this is a roadmap for how we go from academic to in, um, commercial. It still doesn't get you a lot of money, but it gets you uh, a way of just uh, determining the market and working out the next step. 
which is obviously to do something like a spin-off. So one of the opportunities we had in packaging these tools together for a specific company um, was basically um, developing workflow. Industry wants to see a workflow, academics abhor workflows. So you've got that uh, tension between the two ways of thinking. So we had to build, obviously, our group partitioned into two sorts of people, those who want to do applications and those who actually want to stay with the pure stuff. We always took the view of using the applied research to cross-subsidise the, the group. So we always go through, back through that central point. The central point is, if you like, the governing body that decides whether it's ethically worth doing, if it's worth enough money, and if we can tax it enough so that we can do the pure research we always should be doing. Now, there's one part left out of that uh, matrix, and you see we've now crossed into the, the commercial side, and that's to develop that final quadrant. Well, we didn't do that. We actually decided that we could actually build something which was both served a dual role. We could build a public interface uh, which allowed people access, publicly funded researchers, access to all these commercially developed tools for free, but also to act as a service for industry who wanted to engage in different levels. It might be groundwater remedi remediation or materials analysis or all sorts of areas of industry that need these 3D tools. So we built this system, and this is going to be a, um, a, a we call it the CT lab. It's going to have lots of 3D printers and lots of 3D scanners, but basically an open forum for inventors of all types, discoverers of all types, and industry. So in that last chance, we have a, um, an opportunity to stay academically free but build into a, a commercial nexus. So that's, in a way, all background for why we were prepared to work with an artist. The issue with working an artist is simple. You treat them like a researcher. You treat them like any collaborator that comes into the group. Now, that's a statement of, that's fact. In fact, we, um, when I first met Vicky, we, we knew that immediately. That's how to work with artists. Um, not all my scientists understood that. And so over this time, over this process of developing a, a, a group which is broadly accepting of change, then you find that they're quite, acceptable to, uh, quite accepting of any sort of uh, new intellect that comes into the group. It's breaking down the barriers. So I'll um, finish just there. I've got a short animation, which is something I've taken out of Erica Seckham, the first artist in residence we, we got through uh, Nikki's ANAT funding. Uh, Erica's just, with uh, a visual scientist in our group, RJ Lamai, worked on a 3D representation of a, a very common object. It's called Monster. Uh, it's a lovely exhibition. It's just finished in Canberra. If you're at that exhibition, you'd be putting glasses on and seeing this in 3D, and you'd be handling um, large and life uh, replicas of this, this animal, which you'll undoubtedly under, uh, understand what it is when you see it evolve. <laughs> but it's been a lovely opportunity to work with um, Erica. Erica's taught um, some of the mathematicians that uh, artists can actually think more deeply about nonlinear systems and, in fact, they have the equations to solve. So it's, uh, it's been a real, wonderful education and cross-fertilisation, uh, as we've found with other engagements we've have had with industry and, uh, and even, um, well, journalists. We've had a journalist once in our group too. <laughs> so there we go. <laughs> so thanks very much.